Major Performance 1 Test 14. Uh, this is from chapters 29 and 30, 32 and through 33 on electronic throttle control systems, fuel injection, diagnosis, emission controls, and scan tools. We're going to whip through this stuff as quick as we can because we've got a lot to do in the shop today. Technician A says an electronic throttle control uses a stepper motor. Technician B says an electronic throttle control is spring loaded to about 16 to 20 percent of throttle opening. Which technician is correct about that? That is B. That is B. Electronic throttle control. And I've got right over behind uh, Lundy on that shelf is an electronic throttle body and its pedal. Right there. No, that's that's actually an air suspension compressor, Lundy. You're scaring me. No, look down. You know. All right. See that one? That's an electronic throttle body with a little motor on the side of it. There you go. Let me see that. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about electronic throttle control. This one right here came off of a Ford 500. Now, this right here, whenever you mash the throttle, the uh, even with the key switched on and the engine not running, this will move. All right. So let's say that you wanted to do something with your with an electronic throttle control system on one of these cars that you said, and you say, I don't know how to clean the throttle plate. If you push it open with your finger, it may not hurt it, but it might. So you've got a 50-50 chance, depending on what kind of vehicle you're working on, of destroying this electronic throttle body if you push it open with your finger. Now, it, would, it doesn't hurt this one, as far as I've ever seen. But like on some of these Nissans and stuff, if you reach in there and you push that throttle body open with your finger, you're going to be buying one. So don't do that. If you need to clean the throttle body or, some, or you need to leave the throttle plate open, switch the key on. Don't start it. Switch the key on. Hit your have somebody push the gas pedal to the floor and it will open the throttle plate all the way up. That's how you're going to do that. Don't don't push that open with your hand. I mean, because that's that's bad news if you wind up having to have one. Right. Uh, after service in the air filter on an electronic throttle control equipped vehicle, the technician has forgotten to connect the throttle motor wiring. What will happen when the vehicle is started? What do you think is going to happen if he didn't hook the wires up, y'all? If he didn't hook the wires up here? Huh? It, you're got nothing. You just, yeah, you just put, you can match the accelerator all you want to and it don't go nowhere. When the ignition is first turned on a, on a click noise is heard from under the hood of a vehicle equipped with electronic throttle control, the technician A says this is a normal operation of the ETC self-test. Technician B says the uh, throttle air control motor should not move unless the engine is running. Who is right about that? That's A. All electronic throttle control system includes the following components except what? There's no such thing as an idle control switch on that. Now, on the power stroke diesels, which didn't have an electronic throttle plate, but they had electronically operated throttle, no throttle cable, uh, that thing actually has a uh, idle validation switch, but on uh, Quincy's truck, there's three throttle position sensors on there. As I remember, and on this Ford 500, there's three of them, and you got to you got you need to know how they're going to do. You know, whenever you're operating that. Strange thing was, I was working on a Ford 500. I had a scope that I was using at the time, and I hooked the scope up to the three throttle position sensors or throttle pedal sensors. And whenever I was mashing the gas on that thing, uh, I was getting uh, traces on my scope. But while the scope was hooked up, the engine controller was ignoring what was coming from the TP. I mean, from the accelerator pedal sensors, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't accelerate the engine until I unhooked the scope. And I was a little disgusted about that, but I just meant I couldn't use that scope on that kind of test. All right, now then, um, number five, technician A says electronic throttle control uses a stepper motor. Technician B says electronic, uh, electronic throttle control uses a vacuum control stepper motor to keep the throttle at 16 per 20. This is dumb, man. Yeah, that's dumb. D, both those guys are real With the, uh, what is a stepper motor, by the way? That's a motor that... A little bit at the time in steps. It's basically got you. Uh, the one that I always think about, and there's several different configurations of them, is it'll have one hot and three grounds that walk. And as it's walking, each time it, each time a ground is applied, it turns it a little bit. Or if it's applied it the other way, it turns it back. You know, I mean, it's actually they're going that way or they're going that way. And it's just as, uh, and we used to have a, a little box with a little rocker switch on it. it. Had some electronics in it. We would unhook on those Jeeps. We'd unhook the idle air control and we'd plug the this box in, and we could make the make it idle up or down with our little switch. See, and it was you're testing the motor. Now on the scan tool function, 
that you've got. How many of you did the worksheet on the scan tool where you plug the scan tool in and you go into special test and you tell it to what RPM to go to and the idle air control counts up to that? You know what I'm saying? Like you tell it, I want, it to, I want you to run at 1500 RPM. You can walk it up to that. And it'll go, uh, it'll set that target. It sets a target at 1500. If it can't hit that target, you got issues. If it go over who's the target, you got issues. Or if it's in the dead band, when you're talking about idle speed control, if it is actually idling where it needs to idle without having to, you know, do any of that kind of stuff, I and mean, without having to add any uh, idle air, then it's going to be in a dead band. It's not even going to use the idle air. All right, let me see here. Um, and I kind of got off on that. We're on ETC stuff, not on IEC stuff. With the ignition switch off and the key out of the ignition, what should happen if a technician uses a screwdriver to push a throttle plate in an attempt to open the valve? Uh, the throttle should move, then spring back to the home position when released. See, this is a really scary thing to me, especially since if you move some of them with a screwdriver, like pushing, like I was just showing you, you'll screw it up. You know, you can mess it up. Well, imagine this. It kind of, you drive it into your stall, and it's, it's working just fine, and you push on it, and now it won't accelerate anymore, and you got to go tell your service manager, this thing needs a throttle body, and the customer says, why does it need a throttle body? He said, it won't accelerate. Well, then you drive it in. I mean, you see where that's going? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what would you say, Quincy? Would you want him to give you another throttle body? You would, wouldn't you? But I don't give him another throttle body. You don't get your bad self and everything. Yeah, yeah, well, anyway. The throttle body may be cleaned if recommended by the vehicle manufacturer. If what conditions are occurring? All of the above. Coast down stall. Lower than normal idle speed. And rough idle. We have pictures. Cool. All right. What test is being performed in this picture? Injector resistance. Injector resistance. Uh, what should it be? 15.2. Well, it's going to be usually about 16 ohms. However, if you've got a high performance engine, how would those readings be different? If you've got a high performance engine, how would the readings be different? Lower. Why would it be lower resistance? You want it to operate quicker. Yeah, faster. Yeah. Quicker. You know, uh, the uh, <coughs> the uh, injectors on Quincy's uh, diesel operate on about 50 volts. You know, and they basically have a couple of spool valves in there. But, I mean, that's what the, the ones on the old Power Stroke operated at 115. <laughs> And uh, they, got, they had red tape wrapped around some of the stuff out there. All right. Uh, what test is being performed right there? What test is being performed right there? What do you think, guys? Anybody else? Willie weighed in on it. What do you think? I'm going to say supply voltage drop. Got it? You're going between battery positive and you're going to the hot side of the injector. You know, see how much voltage is being lost between the inject. Now, what's the problem with this? When could, how would you do this test? Are you going to read any voltage drop at all if that injector is not working? Okay, so if you're not operating it, I mean, like if it, if it, if you're going to just measure the voltage drop, can you just measure the voltage drop by just going from positive to the positive side of the injector if the injector is not being operated? You got to have current flow in order to do a voltage drop test, don't you? I mean, like if you're going to do a voltage drop test on a starter cable between the hot cable on there and the starter, big post on the starter, if you're not spinning the starter, you ain't going to read voltage drop anyway, are you? Unless there's some point, current flow in somewhere. You, but it's got to be operating. I would, what I would do if I was going to do that is I would take that negative side of that injector and I would ground it and just briefly open the injector and measure the voltage drop. Now, you've got to recognize that when you do that, you're going to be spraying some fuel into the cylinder if you hadn't emptied the fuel rail. You know what I mean? If you unless you drop your fuel pressure, you know, and, uh, put your fuel pressure gauge on the and you know re release the pressure, then you can do that. And if you've got that thing flowing, you know something else you could do is you could take another injector and just plug it in and energize it, you know, with a jumper wire. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Come if you just hold the injector in your hand because you're still measuring supply side voltage drop which is going to be between the positive battery terminal. Everything between the positive battery terminal and the hot side of the injector is going to be married, um, uh, measured. What is between there? What's between the hot battery terminal and the supply side of the injector typically? No, I mean, what components? What is it? That feeds, what feeds power to that injector? No. The ECM grounds it usually. 
Unless it's an 87 and 90 model Jeep and it sent power pulses out there, which is upside down and backwards, huh? No. The, the power relay. Automatic shutdown relay on a Chrysler. You know, there's a relay on a Chevrolet that does it. There's a relay on a Ford that does it. It's always a relay that powers it up. You turn on your key, that turns on a relay. The relay powers up the injectors and all the other solenoids that are operated by the computer. Because that provides power and then the ECM controls the ground. Yeah, it, it, del it dithers the ground based on crank uh, speed and also it modifies that pulse uh, based on temperature and load and all that kind of stuff. All right, so here we go. Uh, that was a good little question there. I just love these questions here. These are good questions, y'all. Don't you think? Are y'all excited about taking this test, or are you going to turn it into a skeleton? I've noticed one thing uh, that uh, that uh, some of y'all that used to turn into a skeleton when I got in here talking don't do that anymore, and I really appreciate that. You seem to be more interested for some reason. I wonder, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, number ten, uh, how much voltage is generally available to the fuel injectors? Excuse me? What about battery voltage, y'all? Battery voltage is how much is used. What I was just telling you. Good grief. All right. I was just talking about that. Which term describes the electrical current flow in the opposite direction when an injector coil is energized? In other words, when, when you energize it. Inductive. Yeah, so that's uh, induct, inductive reactance. That's what it is. There is also such a thing as inductive reluctance. Yeah, that means whenever you got current flowing through a wire, it's got a little more resistance than it does whenever there's not some. What term describes the electrical current flow on the opposite? Never mind, I already did that one. Technician A says if the fuel pump pressure is correct, the fuel pump volume will be correct as well. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Please. If I've got a fuel filter that's restricted and I power up the fuel pump, I'm going to see the pressure kind of slowly go up to 50 pounds or whatever it's supposed to be, right? But whenever I require some, it's going to drop. Remember what I told you? If you want to see if you got a weak fuel pump, remember this, Melissa. You're going to be work, you're going to be working on the car. You're going to pull that uh, fuel pressure regulator uh, vacuum hose if it's got one on it, you know. And you're going to look at your fuel pressure, and without even putting it under load, you're just going to snap the throttle. And if you see the pressure drop, you got a fuel pump weak. But I start with a fuel filter. Start with what's cheap and easy. Don't do condemn the fuel pump until you replace the fuel filter and recheck it. You got me? Put the gauge on it. Put the gauge on it first. Hit the throttle. You know, well, crank it up. Crank it up. And you're going to see the problem. But I'm, I'm going to pull the, the vacuum line off of the, the uh, fuel pressure regulator if I can. So, you know, some of these vehicles, like on them old CSFI, the fuel pressure regulator doesn't have a vacuum line going to it. It's down inside that plenum. And it's basically letting just the vacuum and the plenum act on it. Mm -hmm. So, you, But basically, if you snap the throttle and that pressure falls off, when you've got a vacuum hose pulled off the regulator, it should stay constant. It shouldn't drop. And if it drops, your fuel pump's weak. It's either that or you got a restriction, you know, kink line, bent, I mean, a fuel filter, something like that. Just remember that. I've actually got some YouTube video on there like that that you could watch if you wanted to look it up. Okay. Uh, I mean, we've actually, we did one in the shop out there. Okay, uh, to technician A says to pressure clean the system. Wait a minute, did I give you, the, did we go through the rest of the toilet? Sure. Technician B says a fuel pump may produce specified pressure but below specified volume, and that is correct too. A fuel pump can also cavitate and produce air and push air bubbles up there, and that causes all kinds of problems if it's a returnless fuel system. Number 13, technician A says to pressure clean the fuel system between 75 and 90 psi before starting the engine. Huh? What? Uh, technician A B says to pressure clean the fuel system using a two to one mixture of solvent and gasoline. Uh, who's correct about that? Well, that depends on how you're going to be doing it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, what are they talking about here? Are you, are you, did y'all read that chapter? Well, anyway, the right answer here, uh, according to uh, Mr. Halderman on that particular one, well, whenever we clean injectors, basically what we're going to do, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. When I was at the Ford place, we had a $2,000 machine, and you would take the return line loose, and you would block it if it had a return line on it. You block that. You would kill the fuel pump relay. You don't want the fuel pump running all this time. Or you would loop out. In other words, hook the return, take your uh, supply line to the fuel rail and your return line and put a loop. And that way, if you let the fuel pump keep running, it's just feeding back to itself. And then you're going to hook, you're going to block the return line coming out of the fuel rail and you're going to hook your pressurized fuel supply with your solvent in it into the fuel rail and you're going to let that thing run at about probably 1,000 RPM with those injectors, that engine running off of that stuff. 
Now you can also get, I've got another kit over here, you can buy injector cleaning stuff. You know what works just as good as injector cleaning fluid that I've used? Lacquer thinner. <laughs> You can run lacquer thinner through that doggone thing. If you can pressurize the fuel rail with lacquer thinner and isolate the rest of the fuel system from it, that lacquer thinner will usually cut any varnish and stuff that's in them injectors. Uh, now, don't ever take any fuel injector cleaner that's designed to use it in an injector cleaner machine and pour it in your gas tank because it will destroy, eat the lining off the gas tank, destroy the fuel pump, and do all kinds of stuff. It's nasty. I got some of that stuff in here, by the way. Uh, and, it's, and it stinks like ammonia when you mix it with gas, you know. Yeah, I do brake cleaner. Brake parts cleaner doesn't cut the varnish like. Uh, okay. But I had all the injectors out too. I didn't just run it through the fuel lines. So. Yeah, but if you're basically, you'd energize the injector and spray some of that stuff through them if you were trying to just do a rudimentary cleaning on the bench, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, uh, the stuff that he's talking about here is a specific type of cleaning mm -hmm. that somebody's procedure. And I'm not going to you know, hammer that question too hard. That's number, as if I hadn't already hammered it too hard. That's uh, that's supposed to be eight. Number fourteen. The following right. statements are all correct it's except. To be a. Yeah, which one is that? 13? Yeah, 13 is supposed to be A. Which, like I say, that sounds stupid to me, so just mm -hmm. take that with a grain of salt. 14. The following statements are all correct except A. The fuel rail and pressure regulator should be cleaned as well as the fuel injectors. Uh, B. Relearning the PCM should never be attempted. Ha -ha. C. Fuel systems that have never been cleaned may develop wax deposits as well as carbon. Or D. On engines operating very poorly, the PCM should be relearned. After fuel system that cleaning, that's gonna be B. What? What is this? Relearning the fuel, the PCM should never be attempted. That's not correct. That is not correct. That is one that is not correct. Now I will tell you this, Sean. You remember? You remember when Sean rebuilt the motor in that uh, Plymouth Neon out there? Well, that Plymouth Neon has got a returnless fuel system, and the fuel rail is actually no. He built the Escort. Oh. Yeah, that was the Escort that Lundy built. But anyway, he. This is important now. He's built, he, he got this thing, it was running pretty doggone good before that. Well, the fuel rail on that one, most of the fuel rails that you see on these vehicles are stainless steel. Well, on that cheap little Plymouth Neon, the fuel rail is steel. It's pure old steel. Okay, so he got it all put back together, cranked up, and it was running terrible. So we did an injector flow test. Incidentally, how many of you guys have done that worksheet? Injector flow test worksheet. Injector flow test worksheet is pretty darn important to know how to do. You got a little tool, energizes the injector for half a second. And you're going to see how much it drops. You've seen it. You remember doing that? All right. He, we did that, and one of them wasn't dropping fuel very much at all. One of them was only dropping a little, and the other two were pretty normal. And what had happened was he picked this thing up, and when he turned that, you know, put that fuel rail off and turned it up, there was rust. It wow. broke loose from the inside of it and clogged up the injectors. Wow. <laughs> and so we had to do, we actually put some different injectors in it after we cleaned that rail out. So that's important to think about. You know, sometimes fairly simple stuff can smack you around a little bit. Um, and I got three vehicles running bad out there. I'm gonna start throwing some, uh, um, yeah, some finals on engine performance this morning for hands on. Um, all right, let me go. Where, where are we at? We're 14. 15. No, 15. Which of the following describes reasons for poor engine performance in cold weather? Any of them. Contaminated fuel, low fuel pressure, insufficient fuel volume. Number 16. Charlie. Technician A says the fuel system should be diagnosed in a no-start first in a no-start condition. Technician B says the ignition system trigger device is used to synchronize fuel injection. Who's right about that? That's, that's basically C. Remember what I told you? You go out there for a no-start though. Uh, that they were talking about fuel system should be diagnosed first. I don't like that because if you do something to check your fuel pressure and you squirt a little bit of gasoline out of that thing on top of the engine, then you check your spark. You like might be starting a fire. I'm not going to check the fuel system first. I may listen for the pump, turn on the key, see if it goes. If the if the pump runs, then you got a pretty good idea that at least the relay and the pump and the wiring and all that kind of stuff is like it ought to be, you know. And your pump is actually able to run. Uh, just because the pump runs, does that mean the pump is good? No. Pump can be bad and still be running, can't it? Uh, can you do a current ramping test to determine if the electrical part of the pump is starting to go bad? Yeah. Moody. Did you do the current ramping test yeah. yesterday? Did that yesterday? What did a good current ramp look like on the fuel pump that we tested? It was good. Nice little bumps, right? And what did the bad one look like? Oh, it was raggedy, wasn't it? it was, I had a bunch of flat places and all that kind of stuff. All right, let's keep going. Um, i got to show that to other people there. Uh, let me see. Um, 16, he wanted to he wanted to see, but I'm not going to check the fuel system first. I'm going to check spark first because I don't want to set fire to nothing. 
Um, let's see. Uh, during a fuel injector pressure drop test, the difference between any two injectors should not exceed what? Well, it says one and a half psi. You know. Um, well, you know how the uh, service bay diagnostic system and the IDS, the way that they do that. What they do is they drop it a given amount of pressure and measure how long it takes to drop it that long. Like it's like I'm gonna. I'm going to be measuring my pressure and I'm going to energize the injector until I see that 10 pounds of pressure has disappeared. And then I'm going to give you the time that it took to do that, which is usually about 250 milliseconds. Okay? So if I'm seeing one that takes a long time for it to drop 10 pounds, what does that mean? If I've energized it, it huh? It's, it's clogged. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not spread as much. I used to do those things all the time. One of the things I'd do is I'd hook up my do a pressure. I mean, I would actually let it pressure test. I mean, pressure difference between injectors, you know, using the time on that. I always love to do that because it'd find all kind of problems like that. Um, all of these are types of injector circuits except, what did I do? An injector pressure drop test, excuse me. Technician A uses a special service tool to pulse fuel injectors. I got one of those in there. Technician B says the injector for each cylinder should only be flow tested four times without starting the engine. That was, uh, I don't like to do it, but three times. Let, let's go back to A. Yeah, we don't have four times too many. Um, number 19. All of these are types of injector circuits except we got we got peak and hold, we got saturated switch, we got pulse width modulated. All, all. all of these are. All of these are. And look at uh, what it, when looking at a solenoid with an oscilloscope, what often follows applying or removing power from the coil windings? Diode ripple is what you get out of an alternator, guys. Second rate amateurs. Okay, what you got to do? You remember what, Moody? You remember on the scope yesterday? I've drawn this on the board. You got 12 volts. You pulse the ground. That's your pulse width. When you release it, what are you going to see? You'll see a spike. And it's going to be about 50 volts. You know how you can tell? You stick out your tongue. No, you're not going to stick out your tongue because it'd be too. 50 Air volts would, you know, make you, you know, have bad percent. trouble there. All right, let me see. Uh, la, 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 la. When looking at a solenoid, excuse me, we've already done that. We explain the engine <coughs> off natural vacuum uh, evaporative checking system. Natural vacuum leak detection. Got any idea? Do you have the other running and shut it off and you listen for a hissing? Please. Is Joe, you just make it up as you go? Mm, yeah. Okay. Too early for me to use knowledge. All right. Let me let me hit you with this. If you park a, ga a car and you shut it off, what is the pressure in the gas tank going to do? It should stay for at least another five seconds. No, I'm not talking about the fuel pressure in the rail. I'm talking about the the air the the vapor pressure in the gas tank. What should, what you going to expect it to do as the engine? As the vehicle cools down, when you park it and you walk away, what should the pressure in the gas tank do? Huh? It's going to go down because it's going to be getting cooler, and it's going to be contracting and all that. Okay? You got to. It's going to create a slight vacuum in the gas tank during this cool down period. It's a very slight vacuum. Okay? If a specific level of vacuum is reached and maintained, the system is said to have integrity. But they have a little switch. It's actually going to change states because of the vacuum. If that switch doesn't change states, what do you know? That means that the pressure didn't drop. That means that you got a leak somewhere, right? That's why sometimes you drive your vehicle, you switch it off. When you start it back up, you got a code for a, vacuum, for a leak. You know what I mean? Evaporative leak. All right. Now, the next one is the true faults. The true faults is the one when I put these on exams, people get the worst score because they just go through these true faults because you got a 50-50 chance of getting that wrong. Okay. The catalytic converter stores and then burns oxygen. False. This drawing shows a catalytic converter with the exhaust gases entering the cat. What are the gases changed to at the cat outlet? We're basically going to make water and we're going to make CO2, which doesn't hurt a doggone thing. All right. The O2 sensors in this OBD2 system are sending a voltage signal as shown. What conclusion can be made concerning the catalytic converter? It's bad. 
Yep. It's actually the rear one is supposed to be slower than the front one if the catalyst is storing oxygen the way it should. You got it? So basically it's uh however, let me hit you with this. If you've got a problem where the front one is not reading right, it can cause them to mirror each other when you don't have a bad cap. So make sure there's no air leaks upstream of the exhaust sensor, I mean, the, uh, the oxygen sensor in the exhaust system, or the oxygen sensor maybe not screwed in all the way and it's puffing air in there and all that. So it, it can throw a PO420 or a PO430 when there's not a bad catalytic converter. Now if you put a catalytic converter on there and that doesn't fix it, is your customer happy? No, they are not. Tell you something else. Make darn sure you're changing the right catalytic converter. <laughs> if your catalytic converter is throwing a PO420 on one of those that's got the little light off cat right coming out of the manifold like on the front of the car, look at the one that's got an oxygen sensor on both sides of it. Now, sometimes if you just walk into the parts store and say, I need a catalytic converter for my Ford Contour or whatever I'm working on, you know, I mean, I don't care what it is. They say, they'll, they'll sell you the one that's back in the pipe in the back that doesn't even have oxygen sensor sniffing it. Yes, we will. And that ain't the one you need. You can put that one on there and charge a big wad of money. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 this is a perfect storm because sometimes the drivability guy says, needs a catalytic converter. He goes in the parts room. They don't ask him which one he needs. They just throw one on the counter. It goes to the line mechanics. They pop it on there, put it back outside, and the customer's like, my PL 420 came back. You know, I've seen that a zillion times. Okay. Well, you got to make sure that you know you're ordering the right one. It makes you competent as a as a tech, okay? Number 25. Which so pins... Was that saying it wasn't working correctly or it was? What, on number 24? Yes. Uh, 24 is C. The catalytic converter is not working correctly. Which pins of the DLC should be connected in order to retrieve the flash codes from a GM OBD1 PCM? A and B. You guys all sure? Are, are you guys sure about that? Yep. A and B? Okay, that sounds good. All right. Hold on, Matt. That was my next guess. Huh? Hold on. What? You said A and B. Yeah. What is it? A and, I thought he said A and B. No, he no, said A and C. No, A and B. You remember how I told you I'm wanting to hear Charlie and Delta and Alpha and all of that so that we'll know which letters we're saying? All right. That's why we do that. And the military people don't have a problem with that, but the people that aren't military can't come up with a word to go with the, uh, with the letters. You know what I'm saying? All right. Yeah. Uh, which tool could be used on Ford OBD1 systems to retrieve diagnostic trouble codes if the star tester is not available? Now, this is old stuff here. Alpha. Excuse me? Alpha. What about Baker? Insurance. I don't want a continuity tester. What's a continuity yeah, tester? Yeah. You ever seen a continuity yeah. tester? Yeah. It's a test light with a battery in it. Yeah. It's a test light with a battery in it. You take it and you touch the, the clip to the tip of the test light and it lights up, even though because it's got an internal power source. Well, Whoever uses one of those things anymore? Nobody that I know of. Okay, but anyway, uh, uh, you're going to watch the analog voltmeter bounce is what you're going to do. All right, how many times must the ignition switch be cycled to put a Chrysler computer in self-test mode? Five. No. Eight. Three. What do you think? Two. Well, this one here says two, but it's supposed to be three. Whoever wrote this test is wrong, but go ahead and put B. You turn it on three times, and you'll see your power loss light flashing codes. That's how you do that. Uh, number 28. Uh, technician A says the generic scan tools must be able to read all generic uh, OBD2 codes. Technician B says all generic scan tools must be able to read manufacturer OBD2 trouble codes. Yeah, you're basically not going to read the manufacturer codes with an OBD2 unless you got a you know one that's got that little bit of a capability. A lot of times it'll throw you the code, but it'll tell you I don't know what the code means, right? So it's not in this library. Technician A says non-emission related codes that make the mill illuminator call type A codes. Technician B says um, what? Emission related codes. Emission -related codes? Eliminate the mill after the first attempt or call type A codes. Which one is that? That's B in it. Alright. Okay, the next one we got here is to a vehicle being checked with a scan tool after sitting in the shop overnight, key on engine off. Technician A says the uh, intake air temperature sensor and the ECT sensor will read the same temperature. Now, when it says key on engine off, it didn't sit in the shop overnight with the key on and the engine off. 
it would have died by then. So basically what they're saying is it's been sitting in the shop all night. Now you're going to turn the key on and with the engine off, you're reading the IAT and the ECT. Why don't you want to start the engine at this point? Because your engine coolant will start getting hotter, you know. So you're wanting them both to be reading real close to one another, right? So it's A. Yeah, basically if they're not reading real close to one another. Now, where should you look for this? I would look in the OBD2 because if one of them's bad, it's going to say, or if one of them's you know, like disconnected, it'll say 40 below. However, and hear this, do you remember, Moody, all of the trouble we had with uh, the Mercury Mariner that kept throwing us PO128 codes? You remember, what did we have, we had to do, what did we all have to do that, remember? Well, we did three or four thermostats and then that sensor. Sensors. The first time we did it, we put a thermostat in it because PO128 is just about always a thermostat. Well, we got smacked around on that because she had a, the lap pop back on and we come over and found out that the engine coolant temperature sensor was lying about the temperature to the tune of about 60 degrees. It was reading 60 degrees cooler than the actual temperature and we used our temperature gun to determine that. So realize that engine coolant and intake air temperature sensors can lie. I mean, not just be open or shorted, they can actually have a skewed reading that's not lined up with reality. And if that happens, I saw a Ford Aerostar one time that they said the air conditioner would cycle off for about five minutes at the time. And so whenever I got to investigating that, the engine coolant temperature sensor was reading just a little bit hotter than what was real, and the air conditioner compressor, the engine controller would see it getting a little bit too hot, and it would shut down the air conditioner compressor to try to cool the engine down. <laughs> You know, I mean, and so this was, we had an air conditioner problem that was because of the engine coolant temperature sensor, see? So you have to think critically when you're running into a diagnostic situation like that. Um, let me see here. Oh, no, 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 no. A type, what DTC is set if an emission problem may damage the catalytic converter? That's going to be a, a, yeah, it's going to be an A. Now, why in the world didn't they put A and A together instead of put A, B, and B, and B, D, and, you know, just, they just mixed all of them up. Uh, type blank DTCs are set by non-emission related diagnostic, diagnostic tests. C. That's C and D. Which C is C and D, which is, don't you just love that? Uh, the freeze frame is stored when what type of DTC is set? Huh? A or C, right? Okay, number true or false? PCM reprogramming requires the use of a special battery charger. False. false. Anybody else know? <laughs> Have you guys seen that $550 Medtronic's charger I got in there that's only for programming DTC? It's totally <laughs> ripple free. You need a, a, a special battery charger to go. You got to keep that battery up. What happens if the battery dies while you're programming? I mean, while you're reprogramming? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many of you guys have ever had your computer loading the, you know, your Windows machine loading these updates and then somebody, and then the power winks off? Oh, that's terrible. What happens? Uh, it just uh, does our, not do anything. I built a computer anymore. for our church over there and the pastor, whenever this thing, he turned the computer off and it was loading all these Windows updates and he flipped off the switch that killed power to the computer and it would never boot up again. <coughs> this is going to happen when you're reprogramming in a controller too. If somebody shuts off the power to the car or something happens, you lose power if the battery goes dead. So you need a ripple-free battery charger that is specially made to have a really nice even charge rate. And that, uh, that little charger I keep in my office for that is for that. Made by Medtronic. Really cool. Uh, so, number 34, you do need a special charger. Number 35, if the operating software of the PCM needs updating, it's easily done through a PCM exchange program. Whoa! That's funny. All right, number 36. Technician A says a vehicle may have stored diagnostic trouble codes even if the mill is not illuminated. Technician B says all DTCs will illuminate the mill. Hey, yeah, now sometimes you'll get pending codes and stuff like that. Technician A says most uh, TSBs, uh, technical service bulletins, involve a specific stored diagnostic trouble code. Technician B says if the engine coolant temperature and intake air temperature reading should be close to the same temperature after it sits for several hours. Yeah, if you've got a vehicle with pressure sensors on it, you know, different kinds of pressure sensors, like on the, like on that diesel uh, he's driving over, you got an exhaust back pressure sensor, 
and then you got to, you know, you get if any pressure sensors you have are also supposed to be reading the same if they're in an open system. Okay, look at number 37. Uh, technician A says most. Did I miss 30? What's it? Never mind. I, I mean, you go 38. It should, should make it last longer than these two. Um, okay, number 38. Uh, technician A says the power balance test is the best way to isolate the problem cylinder. Technician B says a compression test and cylinder leakage test can help determine the cause of the problem. Who's right about that? Mm -hmm. C, both technicians. When should, when should diagnostic trouble codes be cleared? After the repairs are Well, I disagree with that. I tell you what I'm going to do. When I'm going out there, if I pull up a bunch of diagnostic trouble codes when I first plug my scan tool in, I'm going to record those. If I take a picture of my digital camera, I'm going to clear them. I'm going to drive a sucker and I'm going to see which ones come back. Because you can trace trash codes until you're blue in the face. So let's just dump the daggum codes and see which ones come back. That's a Record smart one. Though, and being dumped. Record them before you dump them because you need to know what was there. And I mean, you can take a picture of them with your phone or your digital camera or something like that. Is there anybody in here that does not have the capacity to take a picture somewhere on their person right now? You can put your hand on something, usually with an arm length, it'll take a doggone picture, don't you? Except for Joe. He doesn't have anything. Joe, get a digital camera if you're serious about this, buddy. All right. I don't have one with that Second rate amateur. Okay. Huh? Or your tablet. I don't have my tablet with the camera. I don't have my camera on Oh. Well, they were afraid you were going to take a picture or something. You can get them Google glasses that you can just say, take picture. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Or take video and all that. In San Diego, some people saw people wearing them new glasses that cost $1,500 that made by Google. And they chased them down, beat the garbage out of them, and took their, mash, mash their glasses. Because they didn't want them looking around being able to take videos, but it's doing a voice command. You know what I mean? Is that Yeah. All right. Now, 38 is basically going to be C, actually. No, uh, 39. 39. Which, when should DTCs be cleared? 39 is basically says D, but I do not like that. I do not like it. You're not going to verify the problem every time. You know what I mean? Moody, did you just pull a trouble code this morning? What was it? PO442. PO 442. Do you verify the problem? How the heck do you do that? I mean, you can if you're, you know, if you can actually run a test with a scan tool and it doesn't hold and all that. But what did we do on that? We had to identify it. It says 71 of the of the ones that are reported had to have a gas cap on these. And that one had the original gas cap, so we popped a gas cap on it on faith. All right. Um, number 40. Um, which of the following should be checked before returning the vehicle to the customer? Oh. Okay, do you guys always no, redo the radio presets and all that? And I don't know. What happens if you disconnect the battery from a Honda? When you sit back in there and you look at that radio, it says code and the radio don't play. Yeah, like, like the librarians. Huh? Like that librarian's Honda, which thank God when we did when we took out the radio last time to get the code, we wrote it down and stuck it in the dashboard. Yeah, we wrote the code down. Yeah. yeah. You supposed to read the radio and all You're actually on that. Well, yeah, you're supposed to if you're going to be a good customer. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I thought was very interesting, I went to a Ford school one time. And the Ford instructor was up there, and he was talking about this and talking about radio stations and all. A lot of these radios nowadays don't lose their presets when you take the battery cable off. Have you ever seen that? The Jeep I had, the 2001 Jeep Cherokee, when I'd unhooked the radio, I mean, my, my presets would stay. They were non-volatile on that one. But, and, and that was a factory radio that would do that. Well, anyway, we were talking at, at Ford School, and I said, um, and somebody, that guy says uh, something about radio presets or something like that. And I said, uh, I, can, I don't remember how it came up, but I said, I always take the locator tag that's hanging on the mirror, you know, it's got the big number that matches your key, and I write down the radio station presets before I ever take the battery off. And then whenever I give them, before I give them the car back, I set all of those presets back like they were. And he blinked and he looked at me and he goes, well, you're just really a nice guy. And I said, well, I'm trying to satisfy my customers. I also take some uh, special cleaner we got and clean the steering wheel and do all kinds of stuff. And I don't move the seat if I can get out of it. Of course, some of you big guys, you know, if you get in a little short woman's car, you're going to have to move the seat. And you don't, I don't, if I can drive it safely, I don't move the mirrors, I don't move the seats, I don't touch a radio, I don't fool with any of their stuff. I don't go through the glove box plundering to see what they got in there. I mean, I don't use, I don't chew their gum. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Just leave it alone. If they get it back and they don't have to set their mirrors, they don't have to set their seats, and they don't have to fool with all that, they're happier.
if their steering wheel is cleaner it was than it was when it came in, you know, they're thinking, well, I really, this is a good service experience. I really appreciate this, you know. But anyway, that's it's important to make darn sure. Now, sometimes I have to have the, when I had to pull a console out, and the color, I mean, the uh, console out, I have to take the, empty the console glove box thing here, and I lay that stuff in a box over here, and then I try to put it back in as much as I can, and if there's not much stuff, it's obviously trash. I put it in a cardboard box and put it in the seat, and I put it in there neater than it was. You know, but this business about, uh, you know, and some people will raffle around in a customer's glove box just to see what they got in there. You know what I mean? Ain't that sort of dumb? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's none of your business what's in the customer's glove box. Just, uh, that's their car. Leave it alone. All right. That's why my wife don't trust nobody. She don't even like me rubbing it around her glove box. All right. Now, I got here's a... Uh, Let's see, uh, number 40 is the one that's right there. Number 41, the technician A uses a scan tool to clear the score of diagnostic trouble codes. Technician B says clearing the diagnostic trouble code will also clear all the non-continuous OBD2 monitors. Which technician is correct? Both technicians are correct, although I have cleared codes out of the uh, enhanced room and had them remain in the OBD2 room. So be careful about that. Um, all right.